Welcome to the last month at the Federal Circuit, a look at recent Federal Circuit decisions impacting the intellectual property community. Finnegan partner Mike Flibber joins us now to offer insight into two recently decided cases and their potential implications for those practicing IP law. The first case we'll examine, Click to Call Technologies versus Ingenio, addresses the time bar that prevents parties from filing an inter-parties review petition more than one year after the petitioner is served with a complaint alleging patent infringement. Mike, how did it apply in this case? This case deals with Section 315B, which is a statute that provides that an IPR petition can't be granted and an IPR can't be instituted if the petition was filed more than one year after the date on which the petitioner, a real party in interest, or a privy of the petitioner was served with a complaint for infringement. So there's essentially a one-year window under the statute for a petitioner to take action to file an IPR if it's been served with a complaint for infringement. So many of these cases do involve concurrent litigation in the district court, as well as an IPR proceeding that's going on at the same time. So this statute tries to basically put a limit on the amount of time the petitioner has to bring an IPR at the board. Now, in earlier decisions, the board had held that a complaint that was dismissed without prejudice did not start this one-year clock for filing a petition. So this particular case, the Federal Circuit actually took it on bank, meaning the whole court decided the issue, and they reversed that practice of the board. So I'll give you a little bit of background on what happened here in particular. So in 2001, there was a company called InfoRocket that served a complaint on another company called Keen for infringement of the 836 patent. Now, Keen then acquired InfoRocket, and because it had acquired this company, they voluntarily dismissed the complaint for infringement without prejudice at the district court. And then Keen changed its name to Ingenio in 2003, and then at that point, the 836 patent went through a re-examination process at the patent office, And some of the claims were canceled, others were amended, and then there were some new claims added to the patent as well. So there were some significant changes to the patent that occurred during a re-examination after the complaint was dismissed. Now, at that point, a company called Click-to-Call Technologies subsequently acquired this re-examined 836 patent. And in 2012, so this is years later, Click-to-Call sued Ingenio for infringement together with Oracle and three other companies. And then those defendants in that case, less than one year after the 2012 action was filed, jointly filed an IPR petition at the patent office challenging the 836 patent. So they did it in a single petition with all of the defendants as sort of joint co-petitioners in the IPR petition. Now at the board, the patent owner quick to call argued that the one year time bar had expired. And in light of the 2001 service of a complaint on Ingenio, which again was previously known as Keen, the board rejected that argument based on some Federal Circuit case law that had held that a dismissal without prejudice leaves the parties in the same position they would have been as if no complaint had ever been filed. I mean, essentially that the dismissed action becomes a legal nullity when there's a dismissal without prejudice. So that was the board's decision here. And so then they went forward with the IPR and held claims unpatentable. So the Federal Circuit took that issue on bank. Now, because we had a recent Federal Circuit on bank decision called Wi-Fi One, which held that the issue of a time bar under the IPR statute is an appealable issue under Wi-Fi One, they also looked at this issue of whether dismissal without prejudice prevents the time bar from lapsing. How did the court deal with the issue of the prior complaint being dismissed without prejudice? Now, the court reversed and held that the plain language of the statute only refers to service of a complaint, and therefore any subsequent dismissal of the complaint with or without prejudice is legally irrelevant. So it's essentially a plain language reading of the statute, and the court noted that there were no exceptions for dismissed complaints in the statute, and therefore the the act of service of the complaint is the only event that triggers the start of this one-year period. So the court held that the the petition was time-barred, based on this 2001 service of a complaint, even though that complaint had been dismissed without prejudice. And how did the court address the fact that claims were changed in re-examination? The court held that the time bar applied to the re-examined patent, even though the patent had changed through re-examination after the service of the complaint. As I mentioned, some of the claims were canceled, some were amended, there were new claims added. 
But the court said this is really irrelevant. It's still the same patent. And one thing they did was they distinguished a reexamination proceeding from reissue. And they said that unlike a reissue, a reexamination does not result in the surrender of the original patent and the issuance of a new patent. So we could have a different result, perhaps, if the patent had been surrendered in reissue, but that doesn't occur in a reexamination. And so the court held that it was the same patent and it didn't matter that the claims had changed during the reexamination. They also said that petitioners hadn't shown that the amended or new claims of the 836 patent were materially different from the original claims. But frankly, I'm not sure that would have made a difference in the result here, given the fact that they said the original patent wasn't surrendered, and that was kind of a critical factor. Mike, several parties filed jointly in this case. Did the court rule that all were time barred? Yes. I think this is perhaps the most interesting aspect of the decision, maybe the most surprising. The court did hold that all of the petitioners who joined in the IPR petition were barred simply because one of the petitioners, Ingenio, was barred. Now, the other parties who were the joint petitioners, Oracle and and three other companies, argued that they could have filed their own IPR petitions, which would not have been time barred. But the court rejected that that argument. The court basically said that was a hypothetical argument because they did not, in fact, file separate petitions. Instead, they chose to declare themselves to be, quote, the petitioner, like a single entity. And the court essentially found that because they had acted as one entity, in the joint petition, they were properly treated as an undifferentiated unit, was the term they used, that filed this untimely petition. So it's somewhat surprising, but and I think it is true, these other companies could have filed their own separate IPR petitions and probably would not have been time barred because they were never served with a complaint for infringement. But because they had joined with a party that was time barred, they themselves became time barred and lost their opportunity to challenge the patent through an IPR. And what are the major key takeaways from the decision? I think there were three major points to take away. I mean, first of all, petitioners have to be aware that any service of a complaint for infringement may start this one-year clock for filing an IPR petition. And that would apply even if the complaint is very quickly dismissed without prejudice before any substantive litigation activity. So it seems a little counterintuitive because one of the ideas behind this one-year period is that the petitioner gets some notice and has an opportunity to explore the issues for a year during this period. But if a complaint is dismissed very quickly, there's nothing substantive that may have occurred. Nonetheless, under the Federal Circuit's plain language reading of the statute, that would start the time bar. So petitioners have to be aware of that. The second point, I think, is that you you really can't assume that even substantive changes to a patent during reexamination would stop this clock. So the fact that a patent is reexamined after a complaint was dismissed, was held not to be legally relevant at all. And I think the third point, again, which maybe is the most important one and presents the greatest risk for parties, is that if you join with other parties in filing a petition, you're also subjecting yourself to a risk that if any of your co-petitioners are barred based on the time bar, then you may be barred as well. And it may or may not be apparent from public record whether someone has been served with a complaint. So co-petitioners really would have to do some due diligence to make sure their co-petitioners have not been served with any complaint to make sure that there's no one-year time bar going. So although parties like to join together in these situations sometimes because they save costs, this case shows there's also a significant risk in doing that. If any of the parties are time barred, there's a good chance that you may be time barred as well. So it's a pretty significant trap for the unwary. Now, the next case for discussion, GoPro versus Contour IP Holding, involves prior art. How did this case address prior art? This case involves what is a prior art printed publication. Now, under the IPR statute, only prior art patents and prior art printed publications can be used to challenge a patent on grounds of anticipation or obviousness. Now, here, the petitioner GoPro filed two IPR petitions that were challenging patents related to action sports video cameras. And these cameras allow remote control of the image acquisition. Now, GoPro in its petition cited a 2009 GoPro sales catalog as prior art. And the catalog disclosed a similar camera that allowed remote control. And they argued that because that catalog predated the effective date of the patents, 
that it was prior art that invalidated the claims. And they also put in a declaration showing that there were hundreds of copies of this catalog distributed at a dealer trade show before the critical date with no restrictions on use or distribution of the catalog. And as I said, they had sworn testimony from a GoPro employee that established that. And then after the trade show, GoPro continued to make the catalog available to its customers, to dealers, and retailers through its website. And so the issue came up of whether this catalog qualified as a prior art printed publication. Now, the board held that it did not constitute a prior art printed publication based on its analysis of the type of trade show where it was distributed. But the Federal Circuit in this case disagreed with the board's analysis, and they vacated and remanded the case back to the board to consider this document to be prior art. Does the court offer a legal test for a printed publication? Yes, I think the opinion is notable in the sense that it does describe the test for a printed publication as a broad test. The court stressed that even relatively obscure documents may qualify as prior art so long as the relevant public has a means of accessing them. And for example, a single cataloged thesis in a university library may be sufficiently accessible to those interested in the art. Exercising reasonable diligence to constitute a prior art printed publication So they stated this as a fairly broad test in terms of the interested public and reasonable diligence in being able to locate the document. Does the nature of the conference or meeting have any bearing on determining prior art of printed publications? Yes, it does. There were a number of factors the court mentioned in its analysis. Some of those factors do include the nature of the conference or the meeting, whether there were any restrictions on public disclosure of the information, whether there was any expectations of confidentiality, and if there was any expectations that the information would be shared. So here, the fact that GoPro displayed and distributed hundreds of copies of the catalog without restriction seemed to be compelling evidence suggesting that the catalog was sufficiently accessible to interested members of the public. And the court also said that trade shows are not unlike conferences. They're directed to individuals interested in the commercial and developmental aspects of new products, And here, this particular trade show focused on action sports vehicles. So you might think, well, is that really a relevant trade show? The patents here concerned these cameras with remote control capabilities. But the court said that was close enough, essentially, to the subject matter, and that a primary purpose of the cameras that were patented was for use on vehicles in these so-called extreme environments. And also that the attendees of this trade show were sophisticated And they would have known about these types of cameras for use on these sorts of vehicles. And finally, Mike, will this decision have implications in other areas of prior art? I think it could. We have printed publication issues come up in many IPRs at the board. And for example, in the pharmaceutical area, we often have issues concerning the prior art status of drug product labels. And those are often disputed. And the evidence of public accessibility or whether they're printed publication is often disputed. I do think those cases are likely to involve different facts. And I think these cases do show that this is a very fact-specific issue and can vary a lot depending on the evidence that's presented in the particular field. But I would sort of take two things away from this case that people should take note of. First of all, from a patent owner side, from an innovator side, you really have to keep in mind that any sort of public disclosure of an invention, even at a fairly obscure event or conference, may create prior art printed publications. If you're an in-house counsel and you have people going around presenting, even in small conferences, small meetings, specific trade show events, whatever they're handing out, there's a good chance that might be viewed as prior art. And so you really need to make sure you've already filed patents on your inventions that are described in those catalogs or other materials that are shared. So I think from the innovator side, there's a lesson to take away here. And then from a patent challenger standpoint, You really should be on the lookout for these types of public disclosures, which honestly are are sometimes much harder to find than a conventional printed publication in the form of a scientific article or a U.S. patent or a foreign patent. When you have these trade shows, there may not be a lot of public information about them, but if you can track those down as a patent challenger, you may be able to identify prior art that could be highly relevant. So you should look for those sources of prior art that may not be as easy to find. Our guest has been Mike Flibbert, a partner at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. 
For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.